You are my own. 
Jesus in you everyone to Victory Church of the Bay Area. Please take this time to greet one another. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How many of you guys were blessed by our praise and worship this morning? 
right? God is good. Um, my name is Rena. I'm part of our iServe team. And you know, this morning, I just want to share a few announcements and our offering for today. So um, first and foremost, welcome again <laughs> to Victory Church of the Bay Area, where we exist to honor God and make disciples, right? If it's your first time here, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And we would love to get to know you. Um, we actually have one of these things called welcome cards. should be um, behind the white chairs. Um, feel free to scan the QR code or, or write your um, information details at the back. And, you know, um, and we would love to really just get to know you and connect you to what we call victory groups, where we get to know more about God and walk together in community um, with other believers. And so if you're new here, feel free to fill this up. If not, welcome again. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, right? Um, for, an, for our announcements, we have da -da -da, our 2024 facility and equipment fundraising, right? You've heard this, <laughs> right, last week, and we're saying it again because it's your chance to partner with God in what he's doing in our local church. So, you know, if you, um, you've been thinking about it, you haven't actually... Um, Given, given yet, or really you know, like asking Lord, Lord, should I give? Really take time to pray about it and, you know, be part of what he's doing. Um, and, you know, if you already thought about it and you didn't get a chance to give yet, you can simply scan this QR code here. Um, and it will direct you to our um, campaign page. Or you could, if you have the VCBA app or PushPay app, um, there's also a section there where it says, um, 2024 facility and equipment fundraising, um, and you will be directed to give um, in that page either right now or as a pledge. Got it? All right. So um, for our Tyson offerings, let me read from Exodus 25, 1 to 2. Okay. So it says here, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. And, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know if you're, if you're like me, right? But how many of you know you desire to give, but you always find barriers to give? You know, like, Rina, I would love to participate in that 2024 <laughs> church facility campaign, but you don't know me. I live paycheck to paycheck, right? Or if you're a student, I don't even earn money, right? How can I give? And, you know, I also asked those words, especially when as I was a student. Giving was particularly hard because we're not really rich. Um, you're just getting allowances just enough, right? And, you know, here's the good news. Um, as we saw here in verse 2, from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. The good news is if you have a heart, then you can give. <laughs> I mean, sorry, it's really plain, but... Really, check your seatmates. Do they have a beating heart? <laughs> no, um, you know why? Because giving is an act of the heart. You know, you don't have to wait if you're a student until you start working. You don't have to wait until you make a certain amount of money or reach a certain status before you can give. God can use you where you are right now with any resources or skills or talents or really any amount that you have if you know, if you say that, Lord, I want to give, God can move your heart and see what you actually have. Because sometimes we're just blind to what we, we already have, right? And yeah, and God can use that for his glory and his purposes. And you know, um, again, it says here, you shall receive the contribution for me. This is the Lord speaking. You know, who, to whom are we giving? Our giving is for God. Right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This is not just for anyone or for any purpose or campaign. This is a God who will take the little that you give and turn it into something greater and with lasting impact. Um, I just want to share a quick story. Um, since we're doing the 2024 um, renovation campaign, I was reminded that back when I was a wee little student <laughs> um, in college, I also had a chance to participate in the Every Nation Building campaign. Back then, I remember it was a piggy bank where you put in coins and you fill it out every time you um, put in there. And I remember before that it was challenging, but it was also <laughs> rewarding for me because slowly you see the bank, 
getting filled up. And then now, looking, looking back many years, I realized that, you know, it's just a bunch of coins in reality. But you know what? God used that building to impact the future pastors and missionaries of every nation. And, you know, and that just speaks of how God can turn the little that you give, no matter how little or big that is, into something beyond us. And so as we give, you know, I, I ask you guys to ask God to really move your heart. See, and even, you know, the specific instructions, Pastor you keep on saying, you know, um, specific amount that God puts in your heart and watch how he will provide not just for your needs, but use you to be a blessing to, to his people and his purposes. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that um, you are here Lord, and that you desire to partner with us, even if you don't know, need our money, you invite us, Lord, to participate in what you are doing in your kingdom. I pray, Father, for every believer here today, Lord, uh, for any barriers that they have in giving, that you will remove these barriers, Lord, and see that this is not for anyone but for you. I pray, Father, for these faithful givers, Lord God, that you will... Um, Bless the desires of their heart, Lord God, and that you would give them grace to give. I pray, Father, also for the preaching of your word. Be with us today, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we have several ways to give. You can give through our Pushpay app, VCBA app. Um, you can write a check and drop it off on your way out on the, near the tech booth. And you can also give via text. And so um, all good? <laughs> all right. Um, now let's prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody this morning, and um, welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. My name is Neil Bernardino, and uh, thank you for joining us today, worshiping Jesus. And my prayer is that you would encounter His presence in a powerful, transformative way. All right. So um, I'm excited uh, today because we are starting a brand new series. It's actually a mega sermon series, okay? So um, um, remember during the pandemic, remember that time when, during the lockdown, we, were, we did a sermon series on the book of Romans, right? So we went through the entire book. Um, but uh, here today, we're going to go through the, the gospel of Mark, and um, we're, we're going to go unit by unit here so that we will not miss out on anything that God is saying to us through the gospel. And um, this is an expository journey of discovering God's truth about Jesus, about the gospel, and, his, and, and, uh, and, and its implications in our lives. Now, before we get into our text this morning, um, I want to do two things. I want to explain why we need to go through a book study, and, uh, and secondly, Basically, just give you a, a brief overview of the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, and then we'll go to our text, which is Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, okay? So, um, so why do we do this um, book study? Now, the benefit of going through a, uh, the whole books of the Bible is that we can basically let or allow the, the Bible, the biblical text, to direct what issues need to be addressed, what topics need to be addressed. When we do our sermon series, we pretty much um, uh, do expository teaching, but it's more focused on a theme, right? And then we skip verse, chap verses, we skip um, books of the Bible. But here, we're going to be disciplined to go through the entire text of the Gospel of Mark and then not miss out on anything that, that, that God might say to us as we go through that journey, Okay. And so it's the text that will direct us in discussing what God wants us to be discussing. Secondly, it will help us learn God's word and learn the full counsel of his word. 
okay? And we'll go through um, places in the Gospel of Mark where, where it's, it's quite difficult to, to interpret, but it will discipline us to really seek God and to be humble enough to ask the Lord for His, for His truth and His, the meaning of the text in context, okay? So, and when we go through the meaning of the text in its context, when you understand the context as well, it will help us in, in proper interpretation and application of the truth we just saw. And lastly, it will foster in us, as we go through this, it will foster in us a, a desire and a love and delight for God's Word. All right? And um, that we will become students of the Word and doers of the Word. All right? So th- that, those are the reasons why doing going through entire books of the Bible uh, in the sermon, uh, see, in the sermon would, is, is beneficial, okay? So now let's go to an overview of the Gospel of Mark. All right, so let's talk about the author first. So who was the author? The author was John Mark. I mean, if you're named John Mark, or you know anybody named John Mark, right? So John Mark was prob- a possible cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas was one of the apostolic leaders in the early church together with the Apostle Paul. And Barnabas was, an, was a companion of Paul in his missionary journeys. And so um, John Mark uh, was a believer, but he once abandoned the Apostle Paul in one of their missionary journeys. And so Paul got ticked off, you know, so he, was, he didn't like what Mark did, okay? And, so, and because of Mark, what Mark did... It caused a sharp disagreement between him and his, and his missionary buddy, Barnabas, because Barnabas wanted to, in their next missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark, but Paul wanted to take uh, uh, Timothy. And so now let's take Mark, let's take Timothy. And they, they had such a sharp agreement. Paul didn't want to take Mark again because, hey, he abandoned, he abandoned me. Okay, so... So they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted ways, all right? But eventually, Mark was reconciled with Paul. And then later on, Mark became a ministry associate of the Apostle Peter in the city of Rome, in the capital of the Roman Empire, okay? So they did ministry there. And so they, they basically... Uh, um, established a church there comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, but it's predominantly Gentile believers. And it is in that setting, in that city of Rome, that Mark wrote this gospel. So he wrote this gospel somewhere between 50, uh, the mid-50s and late 70s AD, okay? Um, and uh, he wrote it predom- to pre- a predominantly Gentile um, Christian uh, congregation to encourage them to persevere under persecution because during that time, the Emperor Nero started to persecute the Christians. I mean, out, just out of his whim, he just blamed the, Christian, the Christians for something that basically he, he was at fault at, but he blamed the Christians. And so now the Christians were persecuted. They were being lit up in in, uh, in, uh, as, as to, they were impaled and li- set on fire so that they could be lamps because the Christians did say that Jesus is calling them the light of the world. And so let the Christians light up the Roman roads. Okay? So, and so a lot of them were getting discouraged, but Mark was telling them, do not get discouraged. Continue to persevere even in the midst of persecution and suffering. Why? Because... Jesus Christ, whom you put your faith in, has been raised from the dead. And because he is alive forevermore, all his claims are true. And his claims to messiahship, to his messiahship, had been validated. And all that he promises will come true. So hold on. Hold on. Don't let this persecution um, rob you of, of the inheritance that you have in Christ. Persevere in your faith, okay? Persevere in your faith. And so much, most of Mark's, again, Mark was not, 
an eyewitness of, of, of Jesus, but because he related with Paul the Apostle, who was an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Je Jesus revealed himself to Paul on his, on, when he was on the road to Damascus. And then he later on was associated with Peter, and Peter ba basically became uh, his discipler, basically. And Peter taught him everything the Lord Jesus taught him because Peter was an, a direct eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was with him this whole time. Okay? So, and so Mark's account, uh, much of the information there about Jesus and the story of Jesus were derived from Peter's sermons and Peter's recounting to Mark of the story of Jesus Christ. All right? And so, so here we can see... Um, apostolic witness in the gospel of Mark. Even if the author did not see Jesus himself, his, in, his stories were based on uh, the testimony and apostolic authority of Peter. Okay? So, um, evidence from uh, the earliest traditions uh, indicate that um, Mark's gospel was the second gospel to be written, following Matthew, and that has been, and many of the church fathers believe this, but recent, uh, recent uh, biblical scholarships um, say that Mark's gospel was the first one to be written. So there's a debate there, okay? So, but regardless, uh, Mark's gospel is breathed by the Holy Spirit. It is divinely inspired word. The divine inspired word of God. Now, the book of Mark focuses on two things, two main themes. It focuses on Christology. So basically, he, ha he has a high view of Jesus Christ and his work and his claims and his miracles and his identity. Okay? So it's a, it deals with Christology and it also deals with discipleship. So basically, Jesus was calling people to a life of discipleship, a new way of living under the lordship of the risen Messiah, okay? So, so that's just an overview of the book of Mark. You can, if you have Bibles that, have, that, that, that include introductions to each book, then I encourage you to go through this. We will be going through this series. This is a 55-week series. That's why it's a mega series, but don't worry. We're going to be breaking it down to, into several parts, okay? So, uh, and this will take us three years, and we'll have sermon series breaks, okay, uh, um, during these next three years. But we'll be, we'll be ending on, uh, 24, on, uh, when you talk about the resurrection in Mark, Mark uh, 15, sorry, Mark 16. When we talk about, when we get to the place of the resurrection, it'll be Easter Sunday, of 2026 okay so this is going to be great so all right with that said let's all stand as we read god's word and if you're able to stand please do so we're going to be reading from mark chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 from the english standard version <clears throat> the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ the son of god as it is written in isaiah the prophet Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all, and all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem <clears throat> were going out to him. Were, and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your word. And as we dive into this gospel of Mark, I pray that you would cause us to 
see what the Holy Spirit wants us to see and to mine this gospel, Lord, with your truths that we can apply in our lives so that we can live according to your word, to the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may take your seats. Thank you. <clears throat> now, this passage, along with, uh, <clears throat> this passage, along with the next few verses up to verse 13, comprise the introduction to the Gospel of Mark with verse 1 as its heading. You know, like when you, um, sometimes when you um, read um, a letter uh, or like uh, anything, there's a heading that goes before the before um, each section, right? So this serves as the heading for the entire book. And verse 1 says, um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so here we see the word gospel, which means good news. This is good news, all right? And um, Mark introduces Jesus Christ here as he introduces him as the Christ, okay? And uh, the word Christ is not a surname. When you say Jesus Christ, Christ is not a surname. You know, like my last name is Bernardino, so Jesus' last name is not Christ, okay? A lot of people think that way. No, Christ is the, a title given to him. And the word, the, the, Christ, the word Christ is the English uh, translation of the Greek word for Messiah. Oh, sorry, the Hebrew word for Messiah and the Greek word Christos, which, is, which means the anointed one. And Messiah and anointed one, or Christ, speak of the anointing of God that to, on this person to bring salvation to us. Okay, so, and so here, this introduction, and then he also introduces Jesus as the Son of God. So you see here, he is Christ, the Son of God. And this description is consistent with the, 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 the apostles' understanding of who Jesus is. Remember in, in Matthew uh, 16, when Jesus was asking them, who do people say the Son of Man is? And, and uh, he was asking his disciples. And they said, some say um, John the Baptist, because John the Baptist had previously died. He was beheaded by, by King Herod. And so, and so they say, you are John the Baptist who's living again, you know? So, so or some say Elijah. Why did they say Elijah? Because we're going to look at that later on. They were, believe, they were waiting for the prophet that will come to usher in the way of the Messiah. So they said, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. That's how people understand you. But Jesus said, but what about you? He talked to his disciples. Who do you say I am? And of the 12, Peter spoke up. And Peter usually does that. <laughs> he speaks for the 12 sometimes. Oftentimes he does. And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by, by flesh and blood, but it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. So... G Peter received a divine revelation of who Jesus really is. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so as Jesus said this, of course, the disciples were listening to him. And so now they realize who he is. And now Peter was telling Mark about this. You know who this Jesus is? He is the Christ, the one we've been waiting for. And he, he is the Son of God. And that's why that was his introduction. Okay? And um, when you talk about the Son of God, uh, the New Testament identifies... Old Testament uh, passages that are considered messianic prophecies referring to the Son of God, okay? And uh, there are many places in the Old Testament uh, speaking of God's Son, okay? And, uh, and the New Testament identifies those, those passages in the Old Testament as referring to Jesus himself, okay? And there are many places in the Old Testament speaking of the Son of God. Let's look at one of them. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, it says there, I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay? Today, uh, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Again, this is one example. Uh, and then by divine inspiration, 
okay, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, with divine revelation, the authors of the New Testament, who were led by the Spirit of God, who were inspired by the Spirit of God to write their, uh, to, to write um, God's word through their epistles and through their gospel accounts, pointed to, to this verse and to many others, and saying that this son is speaking of Jesus Christ himself. And so the New Testament authors reveal this. Now, this very verse was quoted in Acts chapter 13, referring to Jesus, okay? Referring to Jesus and... Um, let me see, where am I? There you go. Uh, referring to Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. As, he, as, as, uh, as Luke was quoting this, he was explaining Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and he quote this passage. And then in, in Hebrews chapter 1, um, the author of Hebrews quoted this verse and referring to the Son as Jesus Christ in relation to his superiority over, it, over the angels. And then in Acts chapter 5, again, Luke speaks of, oh, sorry, not Acts, Hebrews, sorry. Hebrews chapter 5 Again, it refers to this very verse, and the Son is spoken of, that is spoken of here is Jesus Christ, and the, he, the author of Hebrews used this passage to speak of his high priestly calling over every believer, okay? So this is just one example of many passages in the Old Testament that the New Testament authors quoted from and said, this is the Christ, Okay, this speaks of Jesus himself. So Jesus' sonship reveals his relationship to the Father, his divine nature, and it also speaks okay, of, of his messianic role. All right, he is the Son of God, okay? And being the Son of God, he is of divine nature because he is God the Son, right? And then it speaks of his role as Messiah. Now, Mark traces the beginning of the gospel in the Old Testament, um, and he looks at several passages from the Old Testament that, has been, uh, that, that, that have been compiled by the rabbis. Um, you know, the rabbis and the scribes were the teachers of the law. They're the ones who taught the, the, the Israelite community about God's Word, you know, and, um, and rabbinic tradition when speaking of the Messiah, they've combined uh, excerpts from Exodus, from Malachi, and from the prophet Isaiah. And this is what we see here. And Mark quotes that, and he said, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and it, by rabbinic tradition, they've compiled all these verses and attributed it to Israel's greatest prophet, one of the greatest prophets of Israel, Isaiah, okay? And that's why Mark said, again, he's speaking from rabbinic tradition here. He said, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So here we see from Malachi chapter 3, Exodus 24, and Isaiah 40, um, these are all coming from there. And here in, in the Exodus excerpt, which is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Here, Isaiah prophesied about the servant's messenger. It prophesied about the Messiah's messenger who would go before him to prepare the way for him. All right? And then... Malachi, so again, Malachi 3 was quoted here in verse 2. And then Malachi, the prophet Malachi, further spoke uh, about, prophetically about this messenger, or it's, also known as, uh, or it's also known as a forerunner. A messenger is known as a forerunner, okay? So Malachi chapter 4 prophetically speaks of this forerunner of the Messiah, okay? And in verses uh, four, 5 and 6, it says there, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, during the time when, when Malachi was speaking this prophetically, Elijah had already died. I mean, he, the prophet Elijah has been long... Oh, now, he, no, no, he didn't die, right? So the prophet Elijah did not die. He was taken up to heaven. It was Elijah who died. So 
my mistake. So Elijah had been taken up to heaven. And so here, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of, the, of, our, of, of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Why is this important? You'll see later on. Okay, so Mark then, after speaking of looking at Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah's forerunner, the Messiah's messenger who will go before him, now Mark introduces John the Baptist as this messenger. Okay, so, and he said in verse 4, John appeared. Now, John, this John is different from the Apostle John, okay? So, again, John is a common name. It was a common name, right? So, like, uh, like for, in, in Mexico, a common name is Juan, right? In the Philippines, Juan is also a common name. That's why my, my, my third son is named Juan, okay? Juan Miguel. So, um, Juan means John in English, okay? So, um, John, in speaking of John the Baptist here, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's interesting. Look at this. How did John appear? How did John enter the scene? He was, one, baptizing in the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he was proclaiming a baptism of repentance. He was preaching, okay, in the wilderness. And this was actually, Mark specifically wrote that, to tie it into the prophetic, uh, the prophecy about this forerunner who will be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Jesus himself. Now, what's the significance of, Micah, uh, of uh, Malachi 4? Jesus himself referred to it when he was talking about John the Baptist. Now, remember, John the Baptist was his cousin, right? So, John the Baptist was the one who prepared the way for Jesus. And then when... When, when he was telling people, the crowd, about John the Baptist. Because everybody knew about John, right? And then here, what he's, he, here's what he said. He affirmed John's role as, a, as, a, as God's forerunner. And then in Matthew 11, verses 10 and 11, it says there, um, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So here, Jesus quotes from from, from uh, Malachi 3 and Isaiah 40, right? The same passage that Mark quoted, okay? And then verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has, no, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Let's jump to verse 14. Still speaking of John, and here's what Jesus said. And if you're willing to accept it, he, speaking of John the Baptist, he is Elijah who is to come. Now, this is Jesus now, okay, speaking of John as the Elijah. So, who, is, who spoke that prophecy? Okay, it was Malachi, but it is through the inspiration of God. So, Jesus knew, being God himself, he knew, right? That's why, this, you remember, it's like saying this, that if, if I'm allowed to paraphrase what you say, it's kind of like him saying, you know what I wrote in Malachi, what I said through Malachi, the prophet? Elijah, John the Baptist, that's him. You know, you get what I'm saying here? That's him. All right? So, and then here's, look at, look at this. He is Elijah who is to come. And then he says in verse 15, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's, it's like saying, do you know what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, connect the dots. He is Elijah who is to come. And then John actually Introduce Jesus to the world. <laughs> he who has ears, let him hear. So now, John is the forerunner of the Messiah now. What are the functions of a forerunner? Now, the idea of a messenger or a forerunner uh, sent by an important person, okay, was pretty common in the ancient world. It was... Common knowledge when they see someone running, especially when they see, you know, people in, in great attire coming into a city, 
You think, wow, this is an important person. Then it turns out that is only a messenger or a forerunner or someone more important who is to come that he is representing. I mean, have you seen the movie uh, 300, right? Remember that scene? This is Sparta! Bam! Right? Who did, who did King Leonidas kick into that endless pit? The forerunner of the, per, of the Persian emperor. Because he was telling the, the, the Spartan king, you know, you know um, Xerxes is coming. And if you want to save your people, surrender now. That was his message, right? And King Leonidas goes, this is Sparta. And then slow-mo with all the abs there. I can't replicate that. <laughs> Bam! You know, so... He kicked the forerunner, the emissary of, of King Xerxes. Okay, so, and that's pretty much what God does to Israel because it's a common thing. So that's what God did. He sent his messengers, the prophets, to speak on his behalf. And that's pretty much what the Israelites, many of the Israelites did. They did what King Leonidas did to the prophets. They kicked the prophets. They didn't believe the prophets. They killed the prophets, the messengers of God, right? Now, the word messenger is angelos, which is, which where, it is where we derive the word angel, okay, a messenger, okay? So the functions of our forerunner, you know, are to come and announce the coming of a more important person, and to deliver that important person's message. Okay? So, the function of John the Baptist was to prepare the way of the Lord by proclaiming the Messiah, who he is, and that he is coming, all right, and declare his message, the message of the Messiah. So, let's look at the functions of the Messiah's forerunner, John the Baptist. Number one. Okay, and again, we're going through the text here. And then we're going to bring application here. Okay, number one, John preceded the Messiah. That means he went before the Messiah. Now, forerunners precede the coming of someone important by proclaiming the latter's arrival and preparing the way for him. The arrival of a forerunner underscores the importance and the superiority of the one he is representing. Okay? Now, God used the widely understood Ancient, context, uh, ancient, ancient concept of sending forerunners, and so God used it, you know, um, pretty much um, he, through, by sending his prophets, right? And John the Baptist was one of those prophets. Okay, so he preceded the Messiah. Okay, again, you can't just send anyone. Only people who, are, who have importance or can send forerunners, you know. No one can just send forerunners. Only, peop only important people, people who are royalty or of the nobility, right? Or basically important people, you know. Uh, you can't just ask somebody to be your forerunner. You know, I'll send you there. Why? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to send me. I'm not going to go anywhere. You know, so, okay, so when you see a, a messenger or a forerunner, that means someone important has a message or that he is coming. And that's why John preceded the Messiah. And number two, John, the forerunner, proclaimed the Messiah. He, another function of a forerunner is to proclaim or announce, the, uh, you know, here in this case, the Messiah or to introduce the Messiah. That was the role of John. Okay, and Mark, verses 7 and 8 of Mark 1. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. Remember, he was baptizing people. Right? I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this verse, again, this, these verses speak of John introducing the one who is to come. 
who was greater than him. And later on, when Jesus was fully, you know, revealed and when he was revealed and he was doing his ministry, and then now some people are now becoming disciples of Christ and, and some, some people ask John, aren't you, let me paraphrase, aren't you insecure about Jesus? I mean, before, you, you're the first one who came into the scene. You had disciples, you had people come to you, and now they're coming. Some of those who were following you are now following this man, this man named Jesus, who was from Nazareth. You know, and John understood his role, and he said, remember what he said? He must increase, and I must decrease. He understood his role. The one I am representing must increase. I must decrease. Can we say that in our lives? Can, are we willing to say, Christ must increase in my life, and I must decrease? That's, an, that's amazing humility right there. And this speaks of the Messiah superiority whom John preceded and has now announced. Okay? He's telling people, someone's coming. Mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, C.F. Mole or Mool, in his commentary, The Gospel of Mark, said this. Let me read it. Quote, The Baptist evidently meant that the great coming one would not merely cleanse with water, but would bring to bear like a deluge the purging, purifying, and judging presence of God himself through the Holy Spirit. Okay? And Christ... As John said this, I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, before Jesus was, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, this is after his resurrection, he told his disciples in Acts 1.5, he said, you know, for John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit will come to do his work, number one, to regenerate you. He comes when you put your faith in Christ and He regenerates your spirit. You're dead because of your sins, but now because of you, put, you put your faith in Christ, He sends the Holy Spirit who regenerates you into new life and then causes you to be born again in Christ. Right? Jesus said that no one can see the kingdom of God unless He is born again. Born of water and spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to regenerate us to be born again in Christ. Secondly, He indwells us so that he can, he can assure us that we are God's children. He can teach us the words of Christ. He can remind us of, of, God's, of Jesus' commands. And He can enable us to live the life of faith that God wanted us to live in the first place. The Holy Spirit enable, indwells us so that we can live according to the will of God. And thirdly, He empowers us for ministry, empowers us to be God, Jesus' witnesses. Okay? He regenerates us, He indwells us, and He empowers us. This is the promise of, of Jesus. And this promise comes from the Father, that if you put your faith in Christ, God the Holy Spirit will Himself come to you. He will regenerate you, He will indwell you, and He will empower you. That's what he's speaking of in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Christ said that. And he fulfilled it in dramatic fashion in Acts chapter 2. When he sent the Holy Spirit to the disciples who were waiting for him. And then they began to speak in tongues. They were filled with the Spirit. And Peter began to preach. And that, after that one preaching, that day one of the church, Peter's preaching, 3,000 were added to their number. Wow. Anointed preaching, right? That is awesome. That is the work of the Holy Spirit through men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only did John proclaim the Messiah and what he would do, he prepared the way for him. Number three, he prepared the Messiah's way. Verse four, again, let's look at that. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
How did John prepare the way for Jesus? He prepared the way by preaching a message of repentance. How do you prepare the way for Jesus to come into your life? It's through confession and repentance of sin. That's how you prepare for his life, for his coming. You don't prepare for him by trying to be good. That's a religion of works, which does not work. Okay? You can't try to read your Bible. Lord, if I read my Bible, you know, cover to cover in two days, I'm worthy of your coming. Or if I pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I pray nonstop, Lord, I am worthy of your coming. There's nothing we can do that would merit us the grace of God in Christ. What prepares us for His coming to transform our lives, what will prepare us is our confession and repentance of sin. The people heard and responded to John's message. Verse 5, let's read it from the NIV. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan. Now, he proclaimed or preached a message of repentance, and people responded to him. Now, baptism is an initiatory rite that admits people into the community of faith in Christ. All right? So that's why Jesus commanded people to be baptized. Next week, we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus Christ, okay? So, people from all over the Judean countryside and from Jerusalem went out to him. Where was John ministering? He was in the wilderness. Now, if I announce today, next week, our service will be in um, somewhere, somewhere where the Joshua tree is. Somewhere in Joshua tree or in the Mojave Desert, you know, or the desert in, of, of, of Nevada. How many of you be excited to go? No. <laughs> Banwar will be. <laughs> Let's go. But some were like, the desert? So inconvenient. So hot. It's so out there. It's so far away. But if you would go, that means there is a compelling reason why you would go. There was a compelling reason why people went to see John in the wilderness. They traveled far. Remember, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, cars then. You know, many of them walked or used their donkeys or their whatever, their camels, whatever. Or many of them walked for days or a long time to see John and to hear him speak. Now, look at what brought people out there to him. Now, notice how John presented himself. Let's go to Mark 1 verse 6. Look at how John presented himself here. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Right? Now, picture this. Clothed with camel's hair. And the people in, in, in the towns and the cities, they're, they're wearing better clothing than, than John, right? But... If you live in the desert, if you dwell in the desert, that's pretty much how you're going to look like, right? And then you eat locusts and wild honey. And of course, locusts, you can eat locusts. How many of you have eaten in a locust before? I know Banuar is going to raise his hand. Yes. <laughs> how, can I say again? How many of you have eaten in a loc locust before? How do they taste? They taste good, right? Okay, I believe you. I put my faith in what you say, so... I don't have to experience it. I believe what you're saying. <laughs> so he ate locusts and wild honey. So can you imagine how he looked like? I mean, what would draw people to the wilderness? Was it his facility? Oh, John has this awesome facility in the wilderness. We would go there. You know, it's like all the lights and the, and the fog machines and the, and the super comfortable chairs and then, and then all the bells and whistles, you know, and all the ushers ushering you in and all they are looking nice. Is it that? John did not have that. Or was it his, was it his uh, marketing program? You know, today we market the church. 
You know, we spend so much in, in advertising. Most churches do. Okay, they spend so much in advertising. Advertising the church, inviting people to come as if they're selling something. Was that the reason why people went to John? No. Or was it because he was wearing his Balenciaga jacket with his, with his uh, designer shirt and uh, designer ripped jeans and his, a lot of you have this, but nah, I'm not going to say, the shoes. Huh? And it's, is it because of that? Now, a lot of people today, I like this church. Because the pastor is so cool. The preacher is so cool. He dresses nice. He dresses like uh, the way I want to dress. You know? Is that what attracted people to John? No, he, if you look at him, how does he look like? How did he look like? He probably looked like a, a homeless guy, right? Oh, you're in California. You're not supposed to say homeless. An unhoused person. No, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what compelled the people to co go to the wilderness to see John, hear him, and then respond to him? It was, there was no fluff, but it was the power of God's word in his mouth. The word of God is what brought them. Why? Because before John came, remember the last time this the intertestament period, the period between the New and the Old Testament, it's called the 400 silent years. Why is it called the 400 silent years? Because it has been 400 years since God spoke the last time or did something. So they've been waiting. They know God's been speaking, said he prophets, but for 400 years, there were no prophets. The word of the Lord was not there. There were no miracles. There were no angelic visitations. There, were, there was nothing supernatural that was happening. Nothing happened for 400 years. And all of a sudden, a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. They've never heard something like this. And they were drawn to it. Why? Because that's what, whether they knew it or not, that's what their longing hearts were, were wanting. And they're longing for God to speak to them again. They heard something new. Wow. When he spoke and when they heard him, his message it stirred up their hearts and we need to go see this man. When they saw this man, they heard him preach repentance. They, you need to repent of your sins. They responded by repenting and then they proved their commitment by going through the waters of baptism. My dad told me, you know, if you're going to that, remember when, when I was first going to the church, don't, don't get baptized, okay? You can go to church, but don't get baptized because if you get baptized, that's it. My, that's what my dad said and I go, Really? Then that's what I'm going to do. Now, during that time, of course, I just got saved. I was newly saved. I had zeal without wisdom. And I still had that baggage of, uh, you know, <laughs> of trying to spite my dad. But, you know, I really did say, I am going to commit. And this is going to be all the way. This is going to be all the way. So I did get baptized. So these people got baptized. It was the word of God. What attracts us to come to meet with God, with His people? Is it our facility? And we're renovating this facility. We will try to look, make it look nice. But is it that, that it will that draw people? Or is it the way we present ourselves and the sermon and the way we dress? You know, you know I can dress. If you want, I can dress with those ripped jeans. It's not going to be edifying, but it's, I'm, going to be look, I'm going to look cool, right? But I'm not going to do that. What I want is that people will come, not because of me, not because of this facility, not because of us, but because of Jesus and his word. That's why as a preacher, I am committed not to gimmicks. I'm committed to preach the word of God. And we should be committed to obey the word of God as well. Amen? And so here, when, when people were responding to him, remember all the whole countryside of Judea and people from Jerusalem went to him and they responded. That was God moving in the hearts of people. 
God was speaking to them again. And John prepared the way for the Lord. Now these people are now more aware of their sinfulness. And now John said, you know what? I'm just the first step, the real step. I'm just a preliminary. The real step is with the one who is to come. Amen? Let's bring us to a close. And I'd like to call the worship team up. Um, how then do we prepare the way for the Lord? We looked at what the scriptures says and has shown us. We'll try to bring application now. How do we prepare the way of the Lord? As our text implies, number one, we prepare ourselves for the Lord's arrival and work through confession and repentance of our sins. We prepare ourselves. How do you prepare the way of the Lord for your life? It's through confession of your sins and repentance. And repentance is not just, you know, growing up as a religious person, I, was, I would confess my sins. You know, I would go to the confessional, confess my sins, but I'm just doing it by rote. It's because it's expected of me. Everybody's doing it. Okay, so, Father, forgive me if I have sinned. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, amen. And then he tells me to do, pray this many prayers and pray this type of prayer ten times, three times. And then, and then he would absolve me and that's it. But that never really changed. But, but true confession is one that brings transformation to you. True confession and repentance is sincere. And God knows if your confession and repentance is sincere. John only baptized those who were sincere in their confession of their sins and in their repentance. God knows. So you can't fool him. We prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord through repentance. But just like John the Baptist, we who have been redeemed by Jesus, we're also called to be his forerunners, to be his messengers. Not only did Jesus save us, but he gave us a task to be his forerunners, to prepare the way for his coming. He's returning, amen? And, and we have this commission. This is the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Jesus said to his church, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or to obey all that I have commanded you. You see, Jesus didn't say, you know what, suggest to them if they're willing, if they want to, and if it's okay with them to try to check me out and try to see, try to check me out in obeying what I say. But if it's not working with them, that's fine. And then don't push it. Was that how Jesus was? He is the truth. And if he says we need to repent, we need to repent. And we need to obey his word. But Pastor Nina, if I obey, it's so hard. You know what? Jesus will challenge everything in you that takes his place. Sometimes it can be your resources that you're going to struggle with. Sometimes it's your relationships. Sometimes it's your fame. Sometimes it's your achievements. What is it? You see, Jesus loves you so much that he will wage war against those idols. He wages war against those things because they are going to kill you. They're going to destroy you. Holding on to these idols will not be good for you. And that's why Jesus, because he loves us so much, he wages war. He will demand those things from you. This is who he is. I don't apologize to them because this is who he is. He is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And he is Lord of all, as we sang earlier. Therefore, as John the Baptist did, we who have been redeemed by God, who ourselves have prepared the way of the Lord, are called by God to prepare others for the Lord through our proclamation of his message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins so let's all stand as we bring this to a close God has called us as believers 
to be his messengers, to be his forerunners, to proclaim his word unapologetically with great love, reflecting his character and his love and his grace. Full of grace and truth, we are to speak his word to a dying world. It doesn't matter if they ridicule us. I mean, John didn't care if people ridiculed how he looked. It didn't matter. He, didn't, he wasn't even insecure. Hey, he's getting more followers than you. Let him increase and let me decrease. What matters is that Christ is preached because this world needs him. Amen? My point is this, and I'd like to leave you this. Just to summarize everything, confession and repentance of sins prepare the way of the Lord in our lives. And this is the message we proclaim to prepare the way of the Lord in the lives of other people as well. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that brings, that challenges us, Lord God. Father, thank you, Lord, for coming into our lives and making your claims because your claims are true. You are who you are, Lord Jesus. Though sometimes we may not like it when you challenge us to let go of the things we put our trust in. But it is for our good. And you're challenging us to let go because you love us so much. And you know those things will destroy us. Lord, open our eyes. Remove every deception. And I pray that we would respond to you with repentance and confession of our sins. Lord, today, if we have not repent, confessed our sins and we have not repented of them, that means turned away. Lord, we do so today. We do so today. Lord, we're like, we hear your word. And your word challenges us to prepare the way of the Lord in our lives. And Lord, if there are people here today who say, Lord, I've never had you come into my life, but I want you to come. So I want to prepare your way in my life. I confess my sins and repent of all my sins. Let's pray that. Let's pray right now. Let's all pray together. You may have already repented of your sins, or this may be the first time. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you offer through his work and through his sacrifice. And Lord, today we put our faith and trust in Christ alone for our salvation. We don't put our faith in works, in religion, in achievements, in being good. Lord, we put our faith only in you and what you have done, Lord Jesus. We put our trust in you and only you can save us. Religion cannot save us. Good works cannot save us. Being good, being morally good will not save us. You, Jesus, alone can save us. And so today, Lord God, we, we offer ourselves to you. And we say, Lord, we open up our lives. You say, come, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Enter into our hearts. Transform our lives. And be the Lord of our lives. We repent of our sins. And put our trust in you. And we receive by faith the forgiveness of our sins. And we receive the Spirit of God to regenerate us, to indwell us, and to empower us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We receive all these things by faith, and we give you thanks by obeying you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer sincerely, and you, you really want to say, today I've given my life to Jesus, why don't you... Let's talk to somebody here. We'd love to guide you towards the next, the next steps. But this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Amen. Let's, let's worship Jesus right now. Let's all thank Him for His grace. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of our own.
I pray that we would live under that love, Lord God, that we would live in the reality of your love and grace for us, Lord, and that we would be able to display that grace as you love us. And Lord, I pray that you would cause us to love others as well, that they may know you, that they would respond to you. And Lord, right now, help us to be your messengers, Lord, to prepare the way of the Lord in the hearts of the people that we encounter. Let the love of God dwell up in our hearts, that we would go out there with the love of Christ and share your truth, your word, and your love for them, that they may come to you and respond in repentance and faith. Lord, we pray this for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. God bless everybody. We are dismissed. Go in the peace and the love of God. Have a great week, and we'll see you again next Sunday. Thank you.